I've seen many people who consider themselves hackers, but still don't fully understand how malware works or what things like a payload or stager actually mean. Well that's exactly what I'll be covering in this video, walking you through everything from how hackers create malware, to the tricks that keep it hidden, and the different ways it's built to act intelligently, so let's get started. This video is sponsored by Any.Run, more on that later. Disclaimer. The following content is for cybersecurity enthusiasts and is for educational or awareness purposes only. It does not provide step-by-step -step instructions on how malware is created, but rather discusses the concepts used by by hackers to do so. Black hat hacking is highly discouraged and can result in serious legal consequences. Chapter number one, a malware isn't what you think it is. Okay so starting with the basics, many people think that malware is just a malicious file that causes any kind of harm to a computer system, but that's actually not the truth. Most modern malware isn't just a single file, but a collection of different components working together to compromise a system, and in this chapter, we're going to take a look at all these components to understand how a malware works, and how it's built to either damage or control a computer system, so let's get started. Component number one, payloads. A payload is basically the main component of a malware, that dictates all the things it will do once it lands on the compromised system. So if a hacker wants to turn their malware into a keylogger, steal browser credentials, or even lock files to demand ransom, this is where they write the code to make all of that happen. Now while payloads can be written in any language depending on the targeted system, you'd be surprised to know that many hackers don't write them entirely from scratch. They usually take existing payloads from leaked malware kits or underground forums, and then modify them according to their needs. That's because writing payloads is a whole different area of hacking, and the ones who write them, usually sell them as a service to other hackers for targeting high-profile or government systems. But for everyday malware campaigns targeting general users, modifying leaked payloads is usually enough, and often goes undetected when combined with multiple obfuscation techniques that we'll talk about later in the video. The interesting part about all this is that while modifying payloads used to require time and manual effort, the rise of LLMs has allowed hackers to do all that with the help of a few prompts. Component number two, droppers. Okay so after a payload is modified, hackers would then need a way to disguise it, and trick the user into running it on their computer. This is where a dropper comes into play. A dropper is basically a small program, that once executed, runs the actual payload in the background, either by downloading it from a web server, or by decoding it from within itself. These are usually created in two main ways. The first one is using a tool called a binder, which bundles a payload with a legitimate software, and disguises it to trick the user into running it on their computer. Now while this method may be quick, it's easily detected by antivirus systems. That's because the way most binders attach files is already well known and easy to spot, but since hackers often disguise their malware as keygens or software crackers, they simply tell users to disable their antivirus systems themselves. The second way is writing a custom dropper from scratch, and these can either be compiled or script-based. A compiled dropper is an executable file, similar to the one created using a binder, but since it's custom-made, it often stays undetected by antivirus systems, and may give hackers more flexibility upon execution. A script-based dropper on the other hand, can be an HTML file or a document, that runs a script when open to download a payload in the background, and these are commonly used when hackers want to deliver their malware through phishing emails. Component number 3, C2 servers. After a dropper successfully executes a payload on the targeted system, the payload then connects to a server called a C2 server, from where a hacker controls it, and asks it to either execute a specific command, or upload sensitive files onto the server. Now depending on the hacker's skill set, they usually use two ways to set up their C2 infrastructure, with the first one being abusing legit platforms like Discord or Telegram. By inserting the API of a Discord server, or including the chat ID of a Telegram bot, hackers often make their payloads silently send data or receive basic commands through these platforms, and this method is particularly effective as the traffic from these apps often looks legitimate, and rarely gets blocked by firewalls. However, since these platforms are not meant to be C2 servers, they only offer basic functionality and may suddenly block access, making them unreliable for long-term control. The second way is renting a virtual private server anonymously through crypto, and then setting up a C2 framework like Cobalt Strike on that server, which acts as the brain of the operation, and allows the hacker to maintain long-term access over the infected systems. This method is far more powerful and reliable, as it gives the hacker full control over their malware, and keeps them anonymous if the server is hosted on the Tor network. Chapter number 2, How Malware Evades Detection Okay so in the process of creating malware, hackers also need to make sure it doesn't get detected by antivirus systems, and this is where they need to look out for two layers of detection that most security tools rely on. The first layer of detection, called signature-based detection, checks for known patterns or strings inside a file, and this is bypassed by obfuscating or encrypting the code of a payload, to make it look different from any previously known malware, while the second layer of detection, called behavior-based detection, looks for how a program behaves after it runs or something, and this is bypassed by making the malware run intelligently, or by injecting it into to legit processes like Windows PowerShell or Explorer.exe. Now while I'm not going to cover what this means, or how hackers can perform some more evasion techniques like making a malware run directly in memory, you can always look them up if you're interested in learning more. Chapter number 3, Adding Persistence to a Malware. 
Apart from hiding malware, hackers also need to make sure it stays persistent, and automatically runs in the background after a system reboots or something. This is usually done by adding a few lines of code in the payload to tamper with the Windows registry, drop itself in the startup folder, or even create scheduled tasks that keep it alive. Now while there are dozens of other techniques we're not gonna cover, the main purpose of adding persistence to a malware is either long-term control or espionage. Chapter number 4, Making a Malware Modular Speaking of long-term control, you should also know that hackers often make their malware modular in design, which means it may contain more than one payload or dropper. So there may be an initial dropper, which installs a payload on the targeted system, but then that payload may also act as a dropper, and install additional payloads later on. Doing this allows a hacker to add more capabilities to their malware, as they can include one payload having keylogging functionality, while the other one designed to steal files from the system. And since there are multiple payloads, it makes the entire malware harder to remove, as if one payload gets detected, the remaining ones can simply reinstall it. Now while not all malware is modular, many serious ones are, and in the next chapter, we'll take a look at one real example to see how it behaves in action. Chapter number 5, Testing and Analyzing a Malware Okay so now that we know how a malware is created and the different concepts related to it, let's now take a look at one in action, and see how all of those pieces come together using the sponsor of this video Any.Run. AnyRun is a cloud-based sandbox that helps businesses and professionals analyze how a malware behaves by running it in a controlled environment, and so if we wanted to analyze a malware from scratch, we could either upload a sample directly from here, or pick one from a vast library of submissions to choose from. What's nice about AnyRun is that it lets you customize your entire sandbox, from selecting the operating system or runtime, to enabling features like automated interactivity, which auto-clicks through installers or phishing pages, and helps you trigger malware that tries to evade analysis. After a malware is up and running, AnyRun will provide you with multiple analysis tabs, each giving you a different view of what the malware is actively doing behind the scenes. So for example, the network tab here shows you all the network connections a malware is making, which may include things like when a dropper downloads a payload from an external server, or when a payload connects to a C2 server to receive commands or exfiltrate data. Then there's the Files tab, which shows you things like where the dropper saves the payloads on the disk, or how the payload creates temporary files to help it run in the background without being noticed. The Process tree gives you a full breakdown of what the malware is actively doing behind the scenes, whether that be creating scheduled tasks that keep it running after a reboot, or modifying registry keys. Now earlier I mentioned that hackers often don't write their payloads from scratch, and usually modify the ones from leaked malware kits or underground forums, so the problem with doing that is if a hacker doesn't make enough changes, any run can easily identify what payloads were likely used used, and list those next to the tracker section right here. Next, since we now know that this malware is modular in design and uses more than one payload, we can also click on this graph button here, and see a complete diagram of which dropper spawned which payload, and then what that payload did afterwards. This is a great way to visually understand the full infection chain of a malware, without needing to connect the dots manually. Apart from this, any run also gives you a quick summary of all the suspicious behaviors a malware triggered next to the indicators tag here, or even export the whole investigation into a single report. And while I can't go through all the other useful tools it offers, like TI Lookup for quickly checking if an IP address is linked to threats, or TI feeds that provide live data about malicious sites and servers, you can try it for free using your business email, and explore the rest for yourself. It's a great tool to either study how a malware behaves, or reverse engineer its functionality without needing to run it on your own computer. Chapter number 6, How Malware is Delivered Okay so now that we know how malware is structured and the different ways it operates, let's take a look at the two main ways it's delivered, starting with active attack vectors. Active attack vectors are the ones that require the user to take an action, like clicking on a link or plugging in a malicious USB, and this is where hackers often use a dropper, like the ones we covered up until now. Passive attacks on the other hand compromise a system without the user doing anything, and in this case, hackers usually use something called an exploit instead of a dropper, which basically is a small piece of code that takes advantage of a known vulnerability in a computer system to install a payload on that system. These vulnerabilities are often found in devices running outdated services or protocols over a network, and I'd highly recommend exploring this on your own, as it will help you understand how hackers can also deliver malware to a system without any user interaction. Anyway guys so that's it for the video, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section down below, and I'll see you in the next one.